Milestones to Wealth has completed two years. And what two years it has been. We have witnessed and worked with a lot of investors in M2W and we have helped them achieve their goals and their milestones. 2023 has been a roller coaster for all investors in the market. Small and mid caps have been the best performing category in the equity segment. But has M2W done better than direct investing? Can M2W sustain the performance that we have been able to generate in 2022 going forward? Join me in this championship series where we compare Milestones to Wealth as a program to direct stock investing. Friends, we are going to delve into the topic why mutual funds are still important. A couple of years ago, when we had DMAT accounts in excess of 10 crores being opened in a very short burst of time, there was a point of view amongst market watchers, media and others that mutual funds are probably not going to enjoy the same prominence they did over the past three decades. The view was that the investor was ready for different alternatives. When I say alternatives, direct investing in equity was one, buying ETFs instead of active mutual funds was another which meant that the mutual funds would still be servicing them but would not be very relevant and small case was talked of as the other. Cut to October 23 and we have seen mutual funds do exceptionally well in asset gathering over the very period when we were expecting to see something quite different. Also, the number of folios, the SIP book, everything seems to be growing. The stock market where these asset management companies are already listed was also not so sure about the future of these mutual funds. We saw AMC valuations contract significantly over the last 18 months or so. But they have regained some of the loss they suffered during this valuation contraction too. We are seeing investors being very selective about mutual fund schemes, but we are still seeing them go more towards active funds. Are mutual funds on their way to losing their relevance? Is active management on the way out? Where do we position passive management, will direct completely eclipse distributed funds in the future. We are going to discuss all these topics in this conversation with Subra. Subra, let me start with that pessimism which we had about AMCs. As an investor, you have seen the way HDFC AMC stock came to 1700 and I think one of the promoter companies also sold at that price which was quite sad actually. But as it turns out, in hindsight, that sale was the bottom. A lot of analyst commentary on AMCs was negative, but slowly we are seeing that change. Give me a context as to how mutual funds established their relevance first. What did they do right in the first place? Uh, you are talking of long back, right? 30, 40 years Correct. back. See, it's very important that the Indian the Indian investor who was who knew post office schemes as a saver or bank deposits, uh, national savings certificates and things like that, and PPF, and other than that, he had direct equity. He did not have a vehicle which would take him from here to the uh, direct equities uh, to equities. Right or create products which have a uh, little bit of debt and little bit of equity and little bit of gold, right? Hybrid schemes. None of this was available. So when this came, yes, it was an uphill task. A lot of people would go and say, uh, I remember 1998, 99. People didn't understand what is an SIP, right? So it was very difficult also to do an SIP because you have to take a bank. Uh, bank would give a form. In that you have to take signature, or you have to take 10 post dated checks and 12 post dated checks. They would run out of checks, and then you have to wait. 
So all those inconveniences were there, but still when people started seeing good returns, saying here is a safe vehicle and therefore we can invest, that came about uh, somewhere in 95, 96. You have to understand one thing, what happened was the base market, the equity market became very clean because you could go and check every transaction. So a fund manager could not tell you I bought the share at X price uh, based on uh, the BSC quotation. Here a BSC quotation, NSC quotation was available, time stamped. So keeping a tab on what the managers were doing became very easy. So because that became very easy, uh, the mutual funds could sit on top and create products for the common man, whether it was a blue chip fund or a mid cap fund or a small cap fund or a hybrid fund which would put debt and equity into it. All these products started emerging, people started investing albeit slowly, but uh, afterwards when they saw returns, when they saw that their neighbor was investing, they also started and uh, today as they would say rest is history. I mean the SIP book is 15,000 crore plus, maybe it's 16,000 crores now. What about these two important milestones? One, abolition of uh, entry load in 2009 and the introduction of the direct option much later. Two important milestone events which were meant to change the overall cost experience for investors. How much did they help this industry? Uh, funnily, the abolition of entry load, the entry load was like a subsidy to the AMC because the AMC could get acquire a client and the client acquisition cost was called upfront load which was charged to the client, right? No industry gets uh, money for getting new business. So here they were getting which they used to distribute to the guy who brought it. So if they were got 2 rupees, they would give 1 rupee to the guy saying thank you very much you brought this for us and that was being paid by the investor. So at some stage this had to go, initially it was necessary to build up some AUM, after that this had to go, so it went and uh, so that was pretty logical. Also in the, um, in the mutual fund space, there were very many big investors, uh, corporates etc who knew that they were putting money in liquid fund or ultra short bond fund and they knew what they were doing, they did not need the help of an advisor. So they told the advisor, whatever you get, you have to give it back to us. So a form of rebating which was considered to be illegal uh, was there and everybody was happy. The guy was paying the rebate, the guy was getting the rebate, everybody was happy with the rebate and that was happening. Uh, when this was, uh, when they made a direct option, then it spread like wildfire, especially among corporate clients, even though, uh, and there were of course uh, retired employees of mutual funds, retired employees of treasuries, etc., who knew what they were doing. They were far better equipped than the 25-year-old uh, IFA who went to them, who didn't know the difference between growth share and growth option and things like that. So for them it made sense not to worry too much about not to pay a unnecessary entry fee whether in liquid or uh, whether in ultra short bond fund. These are very small amounts but still they need not have to pay. Um, I look at this like you know you land in an airport and they and you are carrying your bag. He says sir I will carry it for you. You say no I will carry it myself says sir whether you carry or whether I carry you have to pay 100 bucks for taking it out right. So that kind of a compulsory coolie charges let us call it that was hurting the people but people were not bothered because there was no alternative available. Now suddenly an alternative was available so largely if you ask me well informed investors uh, whether they are large or small well informed investors and especially corporates they made the shift first and then everybody said oh i can do it myself and then they started had this has it really helped the industry uh, yes and no yes because the maybe the business has grown business the size has grown uh, has it helped the investor maybe the sophisticated investor yes the small investor no See, we see today that uh, the whole debate on cost has uh, completely superseded uh, the debate on investment choices, whether people are making the right choices. Uh, so most people I have seen 
are only talking about cost. They are not talking about the merit or the choices. This is despite the fact that a lot of people who went directly to the asset management company and took their recommendations indirectly because they have their call centers and stuff like that and bought funds which they wanted to push. I have not really got a great experience. That is the bottom line. When they bought debt, maybe they got a good experience. But equity, I don't think they got a great experience. Uh, what happens is when I have seen this in three AMCs, a uh, client walks in, maybe he's a 70 year old, and he asks, Abhi kya chalta hai? or what is doing well now? So typically they say, sir, small cap and mid cap are doing well. So should I put money in small cap or mid cap? They actually don't know. But they say, yes, sir, now everybody is putting there. You know, that's another funny answer, the social acceptance, the social acceptance. Only one fund house, I'm not naming them, only one fund house, that girl sitting at the counter, I was just standing there and observing what's happening. She said, sir, we are not competent to give you this advice. If you come with a filled form, I can accept it. If I tell you something is missing, you will have to fill it. But which choice? Yeah, but only one fund house was doing it. Three other, two other fund houses were just recommending. So, these things should not happen. So, in the direct, there should be some way of how the SEBI or the AMC itself controls or says, okay, every uh, office, we will station one person who will do this. Are you aware of AMCI, AMCI applying any oversight uh, audits on the AMCs itself? Because they do these audits on the distributors, right? I don't know whether they do it at all or whether it is in their mandate. I don't think it is in their mandate also to do such stuff. No, because see, more money is being gathered at the door of the asset management company today than at the door of the distributor. Earlier we were saying the distributor is not uh, exactly doing the right thing, you know, interest alignment issues. The same interest alignment issue can happen at the door of the asset management company also, right? We can't say there is no interest alignment mismatch. There is a mismatch. But it is their own association. I won't trust their audit report as much as I would trust a SEBI audit report. Oh, you are saying that it has to be at the hands of the regulator. Yeah, we can't have an association uh, no, which we least, create. No, I thought at least... No, my thinking was if you are doing it here, are you doing it there also? I am not, not seen. But I have... I am aware of the process these guys deploy. And it's quite a tragic thing from an investor point of view. Uh, and the investor wants to go there only to save that point, whatever, 5, 7. What I have noticed after a direct option came is people who don't know anything about mutual funds. Know only one thing. I want to save that point 5 to point 7. So I saw this in 2020, after the crash, when the market was rallying, Sometimes September, October, a lot of people who ask me, sir, what mutual fund to buy? Tell, advise me on mutual fund. I said, uh, I cannot give you uh, advice because I am RIA. Unless you are my client, I can't give you advice. Then he said, okay, you do, you just tell me what to buy. I will go and buy. I said, even if you, from a distribution point of view, I cannot give you instant advice. If you are not my client, I am not supposed to. So he got very angry with me. Then they said, uh, I don't need anything, sir. I know to buy this blue chip fund. So I said, be sure of the risks you are taking. Know the valuation. Know the investment philosophy. And ask yourself whether you have upside. Okay. I am only giving you a word of caution. I am not saying anything more. So he said, no, I will not invest in anything but the direct option. I will tell you the sum. That is why you will. His sum is 1000 rupees a month. And he grudges, paying what, 10 rupees, total of 120 rupees a year for choice. So he has invested 1000, then he increased it further after 6 months, he started investing 5000, then after one year he did more, 10,000. So today he has put quite a bit, so maybe about roughly about 2 and a half lakhs or something like that. And, uh, Underperformance to the benchmark is quite high. It's not uh, so. Ravi is not made money. So again, met me. He said, "Sir, uh, I think uh, I chose direct. Direct is correct, but uh, my results are not so good." Ah, over and above this, this guy has paid D-match charges to the platform. 
she had an open and deep pad account he paid d match charges to the platform so i told him see the cost you incur for advice either incidental or through raa has to do justice to your investment performance it should do better than what you would do on your own otherwise you don't need anyone if you are able to do better than what an advisor says but the cost of doing mistakes like this who is going to pay and giving this example because the smallest guy who has no experience has been completely brainwashed that he should open a demat account in a platform and go direct then there are no costs involved okay there is a decision cost there is a demat cost and there is an opportunity cost there are three costs involved which nobody writes if you see all the media commentary it will say that if you do this 10000 sip for 20 years and at the end of 20 years you make this much return your difference in value corpus between a and b will be so much between regular and demat what about timely selling timely buying timely step up timely lump sum or oh, not panicking hand holding switching from one product to another these are all things which every investor will need to do at some point in time now the platform is like a piece of wood it's not going to give him anything beyond this cost arbitrage it can't do even one of these six things right but in order to save that small money he has given up on all these essentials which a portfolio will need whether you are a mutual fund or whatever if you ask why he has this thought process i think it is because of our ecosystem surrounding investment in our country it's the media it's the social media if you say ill of mutual funds if you say ill of cost you can immediately get following a peculiar situation was a guy who has got all his income coming from mutual fund distribution telling others go and invest in the index don't go to a distributor don't go direct go only to index, index. but that should be also applicable to his clients if it's a correct advice right but all this noise has basically made millions of people buy mutual funds in direct option incur a distribution cost uh, under direct there is a cost it's not cost free incur a demat cost right and also incur opportunity cost because he made bad choices right there is nobody who talks about this cost why why is our system so imbalanced socially societally why are we so imbalanced that nobody wants to present the other side that's what i'm wondering the benefit side you only talk about cost side now what about the benefit side so this is like you know government is very happy bringing a law against landlords 